So welcome everyone. And thank you very much for your patience while we got some technical issues sorted. Um, so it's great to see so many of you here despite this change in online platform. Today, we're honored to have with us Dr. Suzanne Devkoda. Suzanne is the Director of Microbiome Research at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, um, where she's also an assistant professor in the Division of Gastroenterology, which investigates the role of diet in shaping the community of bacteria that live in our intestines and the role of these in inflammatory bowel diseases. Um, Suzanne received her bachelor's in biology and chemistry at the University of Illinois, where she also received her master's in nutritional sciences, and then she went on to earn her PhD from the University of Chicago in molecular metabolism. Um, she uh, has completed her postdoctoral training at the Jocelyn Diabetes Center at the Harvard Medical School, where she was a Bronco Weiss fellow. Uh, and it was during this time that I met her as a fellow Bronco Weiss fellow. <laughs> um, and I've had the privilege to see her research develop over the years. And I'm really looking forward to hearing more about her work that she's doing now on the gut microbiome as biosensors on host nutritional deficiency. So without further ado, Suzanne, you can take it on from here. Okay, great. And then let me share my screen with you. Okay, great. I think this is up. Thank you, uh, Sylvie, for that introduction. And um, thank you, everyone, for attending. I know it's uh, uh, unusual times right now. And um, I think everyone, uh, sometimes I think our basic uh, research focus in our own individual labs, in many ways, seems a distant memory at the moment. Um, and our priorities, I think, are on a lot of other things at this time. Um, so I hope my talk today um, can maybe offer a diversion, um, get your minds off of what's going on globally, um, and uh, you know, think about um, the good things that microbes can do to our bodies um, and where they can be beneficial. So um, as uh, Sylvie mentioned, um, I lead the microbiome research program uh, at Cedar sinai which is where my lab is located, and um, I um, have teaching some teaching responsibilities at UCLA. Um, but we are very interested in clinical questions around gut microbiome research. Um, my lab is historically interested in in how diet can shape the gut microbiome, and um, uh, and we we do some rodent work and we do a lot more human work at the moment. But I'd say half our lab now is, is still dedicated to diet microbe interactions, and um, the other half of my lab is is interested in in uh, disease based clinical questions um, such as uh, inflammatory bowel diseases and uh, diabetes and, and metabolic. Um, uh, deficiencies. So, uh, but what I want to talk to you today is, uh, to you about today is um, uh, one of our diet studies that we have going on, and it's one that we're pretty excited about. Um, let me see if I can move these. There we go. Okay. Um, and it's one we've been working on for a couple years uh, in collaboration with colleagues at UCSD, uh, Illinois, and uh, the University of the West Indies. And um, I think uh, if anyone, I'm happy to take questions as they come up. Um, this will be my first Zoom presentation. So if um, I don't, uh, uh, if I miss some questions, maybe one of the hosts can, can interrupt me and, and, and bring that to my attention. Okay, um, so I'll give a, a little bit of a background for you guys. Um, uh, you know, I'm sure there's a diverse audience here uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, your background in both maybe nutrition and also in the gut microbiome. Um, so I'll try to give sort of a broad, broad background for some context today. So uh, in the field uh, of, of gut microbiome research, um, it is, I can pretty confidently say that it is accepted that diet is uh, really the primary determinant of what microbes you will have colonizing your gut. And this is um, uh, really evidenced from a lot of early life microbiome studies. Uh, certainly, you know, um, studies, longitudinal studies following infants from birth, you know, going on to breast milk or formula, and then being weaned on to um, 
uh, you know, mixed solid foods and finally to a full adult diet, uh, the succession of microbial colonization of the gut is really acutely determined by those dietary exposures. And that continues throughout life, even though um, our diet uh, as an adult, our microbiome is far less variable as it is in our younger years, um, we can still uh, alter our microbiome even within a 24 hour period if we radically change our diet or from, for example, international travel. If you're there in Arizona and then you travel to maybe Northern Europe or you travel to Asia, um, your gut microbiome will co composition will will change in line with that changing diet. Um, but evidence does show that once you return back to your native diet, your microbes will largely rebound. It's really a factor of how long you expose it to a new dietary um, exposure. And um, along those lines, you can also uh, change your microbiome composition um, in many ways for the long term as well. So diet is really a useful tool, both for health and understanding disease, but truly as a tool for understanding the gut microbiome. So from a health perspective um, and, and how, uh, how we use it as a, also as a tool to understand the microbiome, um, the, the bacteria in our gut, you know, we have our mouth to our anus, that's our GI tract. And uh, the bacteria that colonize our stomach versus our upper small bowel versus our colon um, are very different. And they, um, uh, you know, as they are introduced into our GI tract um, over the course of time, they settle in certain niches in our gut. And largely this is determined by the, um, the food and the nutrient uptake at those regions of the intestines. So for example, uh, bacteria that are really rely on, on fermentation and, and fiber fermentation and complex polysaccharides will tend to land in your colon and take up root in your colon because that's where the fermentation of those um, uh, dietary components um, take place. And so really where your microbes um, uh, reside is, is uh, a very practical uh, uh, niche selection in, in the gut and it is determined by, by nutrient uptake at those, at those sites. Um, but sometimes uh, that colonization um, uh, is, can occur perfectly, um, but you still can have certain um, microbial perturbances in the gut um, that are induced by dietary perturbations um, that can lead to, to disease. Um, and often the hallmark of that is if you have a dramatically reduced diversity of the gut microbiome, which has been shown to be induced by very high fat diets or primarily highly saturated fat diets and low fiber diets, you can actually reduce the overall diversity of your gut microbiome. And when you have a low diversity, um, you can actually set yourself up uh, for uh, disease susceptibility. Even just from a practical standpoint, um, the concept of competitive exclusion, if you have fewer bacteria colonizing niches, you have more available niches for bad players to take root. So you want to promote a healthy and diverse gut microbiome uh, through, uh, through the foods that you eat. And, and right now, the one thing that if you ask any microbiome person, what food should I eat to promote diversity, it really is, is fiber. Um, and uh, it's not the sexiest thing in the world, you know, fiber, but it really is vitally important. And we know that for sure. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about, more about fiber in, in, in my talk today. Um, but also along those lines, if you do choose to eat, you know, vegetable and fruit rich diet, that, that is usually the sources of your fiber, you can promote that diversity and, um, and that will promote um, uh, uh, good intestinal health. And it helps feed the, the byproducts of fiber fermentation, can feed your um, uh, colonocytes um, and provide an energy source for, for, um, for your gut as well. And that's just a very, you know, there's many multiple other facets to that. So this is just a very high level summary. So uh, diet is uh, actually, you know, it's very complex. And, and at, the, at the macronutrient level, at the very high level, we bin our foods into the main categories that are calorie containing. So carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. And alcohol, actually, we don't often appreciate the alcohol as a macronutrient, but it does carry a caloric load. And, and just for your reference, these are the uh, kcals per gram of each one of your macronutrients. It's just... Um, Good to know that not all foods that we eat, you know, have the same impact on our on our on our bodies. Um, 
for me, when I was um, uh, first early, early on started thinking about the microbiome, um, my background in nutrition was really interested in uh, high, car uh, high protein, low carb diets um, for uh, treatment of obesity, but also for, for bodybuilders and, and muscle building. And, and I spent most of my master's studying that, the, how you can manipulate proteins and carbs for metabolic benefit. And then when I did, uh, when I was doing my PhD, um, in grad school, I said, well, you know, I've, I've, I've done carbs and protein, let's look at fat. So I really focused on fat um, during my PhD and, uh, and in, primarily in terms of how it relates to the gut microbiome. Uh, and then now it's sort of come full circle. And uh, we really, in our lab, when we set out to do this study, um, uh, stepped back and just looked at dietary patterns in, in America today and how people are thinking about foods differently. And I think people are in many ways um, uh, much more conscious about the foods that they're eating and are more experimental about the ty types of diets that they eat. And so we were very curious about vegans and omnivores. And especially since a lot more people are really moving towards plant-based diets today. And if you look at a lot of, I don't want to, um, uh, sort of generalize here, but uh, indulge me for a moment, I, I, I will have to do that. Um, um, uh, many individuals, you know, will educate themselves um, in advance before, let's say, going from meat eating to vegan or vegetarian, but many don't. And one of the key things that I always bring up about switching to a, especially a vegan diet, is um, the issue with plant proteins and how you select your protein source as a, as a vegan. Um, and unless you're taking a whey protein supplement or some other sort of supplement to supplement your protein, you're going to rely on, on, um, on your vegetable sources of protein. But most plant sources are deficient in one or more amino acids and essential amino acids, actually, whereas animal-based protein contains all the amino acids. And so you don't have to think about it as much if you're an omnivore eating animal-based products, you, you, will, you will automatically get the repertoire of amino acids. But if you're going on a, a vegan diet, you actually have to be conscious about how you combine your plants so that you actually get all the repertoire of amino acids that you need. And what I tend to see, especially in, in, in younger women, um, in adolescents and early teen years, is that they often um, will not um, uh, or don't have the resources to understand that um, and do the research to understand that difference. Um, and so um, they will tend to eat the foods they really like to eat um, and that are palatable without thinking consciously about, okay, I really need to have much more diversity so I don't create an, uh, uh, a protein deficiency, which is really critical at that point of life when you are still growing. So um, the, but the interesting thing though, is you don't often have vegans showing up to the, um, to the doctor with overt amino acid deficiencies. And so based on the food intake, you would assume a deficiency, but you're not actually seeing that physiologically. And so we thought there must be some compensatory mechanism happening in the body. And we believe that could be the gut microbiome. Um, so just a little bit of uh, uh, how, you know, thinking about, um, again, you know, how does the world eat? Um, we, and, and since we were interested in this question of, of proteins and, and vegetable-based diets, um, you can see here in red, the, the countries that eat the most, this is total protein of all kinds of protein. Um, the countries that eat the most protein are North America, um, South America, and Australia, and parts of Europe and, and Asia. Um, and then if you overlay this with global carbohydrate consumption, um, you see that it's actually the opposite. So the kind of flip back here, the countries that eat the most uh, protein tend to eat the least carbohydrates. Um, and that sort of makes sense because if, if you have, you know, your, you have only so much of the macronutrient you can eat, if the hundred percent is all the food that you're eating, if you eat less of something, you have to eat more of the other. Um, and so the areas where you, you do see a lot of carbohydrate consumption are um, in Africa and um, in parts of, uh, in parts of Asia. Now, if you break down the protein consumption, 
uh, to uh, add the type of protein and specifically look at the animal-based protein, uh, you see that really the United States, Argentina, and Australia are um, the largest animal-based um, uh, consumers in, uh, in some parts of, of Asia and Europe as well. Uh, interestingly, these are also the countries that produce the most um, uh, meat, especially uh, uh, um, uh, beef in the world. So Argentina, Australia, and, and America, and some parts of Europe are our largest uh, meat producers. So I guess perhaps that, that makes sense. Um, but uh, going back to um, uh, now getting into a little bit of the nitty gritty of uh, the comment I made earlier about, uh, okay, uh, if you want to now overlay the uh, uh, amino acid compositions of plants versus animals, let's actually, you know, you don't have to take my word for it. I can, I can actually show you the, the data. Um, so, uh, uh, lysine and methionine, which you see here on the Y and the X axis, are the two most limiting amino acids that you tend, you tend to see in, in plants. Um, and so if you look at the axes here, on the top right corner, upper, upper right quadrant, would be the most um, replete uh, uh, foods that have, you know, um, the, um, uh, a good percentage of lysine and methionine according to the um, FAO standards. And uh, uh, so all, all of the animal foods fall up in that quadrant because as I mentioned, they have the full repertoire of amino acids. The majority of the plants are deficient in, in one or, or both of these. Um, and, but there is a handful of, of uh, leafy greens that uh, are, do have the full spectrum of, of amino acids. So I don't wanna say all plants are deficient. There are some that have the full spectrum. So oftentimes you'll see that touted as no, you know, um, many plants do have the full spectrum, but then it really comes down to quantity. How much do you have to eat to hit those marks of um, not being in a deficient state? So if we look at this a little bit closer and you look at um, grains and legumes and, and leaves, those are sort of your main types of, of vegetables. Um, the grains tend to be more deficient in lysine, as you can see in the red, and legumes tend to be more deficient in methionine. So keep that in mind if you um, do rely, if anyone here happens to be vegan um, or vegetarian and, re and relies on beans, legumes as a protein source, they still are deficient in, 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 a, in an amino acid. So you wanna compensate that with other, other vegetables that, that do have methionine present. But these leafy greens that were in the upper right quadrant, they have all the amino acids. So they don't appear in, in red. They actually, they actually have um, percentage wise um, per calorie um, uh, adequate amino acids. But I was doing the math on this and um, I've listed on the left hand side your essential amino acids and the daily requirement for an adult in, in the, the second column. And so I took, okay, if you take a, a normal serving size of a steak, which is about three ounces, um, it is uh, uh, on the left hand side of numbers, you see that a regular a three ounce steak, which is a little under the serving size, the typical serving size is about three and a half ounces. Um, you see that it is a three ounce steak will hit all of your daily requirements for your amino acids. You'll be slightly under for valine, leucine, and isoleucine, but if you get the full 3.5 ounces, you'll, you'll hit those marks. Whereas if the equivalent amount of spinach that you would have to eat to equate to a three ounce steak you, would be 32 cups of spinach which is the equivalent of about four to five of the grocery store bags of spinach, which I'm pretty sure no one eats even in a single day. So you, even though it has a full spectrum of amino acids, you have to eat that much to actually get all of your essential amino acids for a day. So I just bring this up because it's not so much, the, the math matters when you choose your diets. And so this was important for us as we were thinking about, you know, what is the role of uh, potentially um, people, you know, people creating inadvertent uh, amino acid deficiencies and whether the gut microbiome potentially could compensate.
So the, um, the conceptual model we're working with is that nutritional stress, um, which can come in many different forms, overconsumption is also a form of nutritional stress. So high fat diets um, uh, or overconsumption of the Western diet, so high sugar, high fat is also a form of nutritional stress. So it's not always just deficiency, excess can also be a stress. But in the context of what we're talking about today, we're talking about uh, uh, protein restricted diets which can lead to essential amino acid imbalances. Now the health out, uh, outcomes that can occur from um, uh, create, creating an amino acid um, imbalance is um, some examples which have been shown are cachexia, which is weight loss, which you often will see in, in um, um, cancer patients, um, but it's sort of a chronic weight loss. Uh, Quashiorcor, which is a form of severe protein malnutrition, um, you often see in underdeveloped countries, but it's characterized, I think of a picture here, of um, the young children with the distended bellies. Um, and that tends to be because uh, um, a second child comes along and the baby has to be weaned uh, a bit too early and they don't get the protein they need at this critical point uh, in life. Sarcopenia is a form of muscle wasting in, in, in the elderly. Um, which actually we start experiencing, I think, some form of sarcopenia after, I think, the age of 40, which is a bit sad, but it's more pronounced in the, in the elderly population. And then impaired wound healing. So um, uh, there's been some really excellent work on um, uh, individuals in burn units in hospitals and the requ protein requirement for properly healing uh, burn wounds. So if you don't have enough amino acids, you could potentially in a mild form to an extreme form end up in, in any one of these, these situations. So um, I'm going to sort of uh, uh, now switch the discussion just for a moment as I'm still giving you background um, uh, to fibers. And so I gave you a little bit of background about why we think, you know, the protein question is important. And I want to refer you back to the global picture I sent, I, I showed you of, you know, the countries that eat protein are, are uh, often the, the countries that eat less, less fiber and the, and carbohydrates. Um, and the other way to look at it is the countries that, uh, that eat the most fiber and carbohydrates eat the least protein. And so the conceptual, um, the thing we're working with was both in the in that global picture and then thinking about vegans and omnivores is okay. So if a vegan is eating just based on the nutrition intake, uh, eating probably not enough um, over protein or the amino acid spectrum to, to um, uh, meet the daily needs. What are what do vegans eat a lot of? And it tends to be fruits and vegetables. And so that means that vegans are tending to get more fiber than the average omnivore. And there's data out there that have epidemiological data that has actually shown that. So we thought maybe there's something in, in the fiber that is beneficial, that is helping mitigate what could be a potential amino acid imbalance. So I wanna share with you a little bit about what we do know about fiber in the microbiome, and then I'll, I'll bring it all together for you. So what the microbiome field knows about a fiber-rich diet is that um, uh, for fermentable fibers, we have non-fermentable and fermentable fibers. Uh, for the ones that the microbes can ferment, one of the primary byproducts of this are short chain fatty acids. Um, and these are butyrate, acetate, um, and propionate. And yeah, as I show here. And, um, and these uh, short chain fatty acids have been studied intensely. I mean, you can just you know, Google them and there's 101,001 papers on, on um, the, the benefits of short chain fatty acids. Um, the uh, enterocytes will take up the short chain fatty acids very readily. And, and for the most part, they'll use them as one of their primary uh, energy sources. But um, short chain fatty acids do spill out into systemic circulation and they've even been shown to cross the blood brain barrier and affect satiety. Um, and they can affect hormone release from the gut and uh, in turn affect food intake. Um, and, and glucose tolerance. So there's a, a, a large number of knock-on benefits of, of these short-chain fatty acids. So eating fiber can result in a host of, of benefit for the gut and systemically. And that's the model that we work with. Um, and so a lot of microbiome research is around how can we promote the bacteria that produce short-chain fatty acids. And in the popular press, there's been a lot of media around, you know, fibers and the benefits of fibers. I don't think anyone was really talking about fiber, you know, 10, 15 years ago, but it's um, all over the place now. 
Um, but in, in, in the actual, you know, the molecular research side, um, as I mentioned, okay, we have the short chain fatty acids and the local localized area of the gut, we know that the short chain fatty acids can promote the barrier function. So it actually prevents um, systemic dissemination of antigens. So there's a immune um, effect that it can have too. Um, and um, short chain fatty acids have been shown to as in the next second figure you see here, um, uh, affect cytokines. And um, uh, there's also been uh, data showing that they can affect um, histone deacetylase and T regulatory cells. And um, there's also been a lot of work on um, short chain fatty acids and, and diabetes. So our thought here, our, our ultimate hypothesis and question really was, can, uh, can our gut microbiome um, be utilized, manipulated, leveraged to help um, uh, uh, in some way uh, mitigate um, the imbalance of essential amino acids that's induced by consuming a low protein diet? And could this be done through fiber supplementation? Um, essentially, if you want to create a new amino acid, which is our hypothesis that microbes are actually uh, de novo synthesizing these amino acids that we're not getting into the diet, well, to an amino acid, you need carbon and you need an, ammo an ammonia group. Um, we believe, and this has been shown, that um, bacteria can utilize urea from, um, uh, can, ha can ha harvest uh, urea um, or the nitrogen from urea, and then um, our thesis was that they're getting the carbon through this um, uh, excess of fiber that's coming into the diet. So as long as they have ammonia or nitrogen and carbon source, theoretically, they should, they should have the tools they need to de novo synthesize amino acids. So this was now, you know, the model on the forward, um, the forward side, which I showed you before. If you have a nutritional stress, a low protein diet, you can create this am amino acid imbalance and potentially adverse outcomes. But if you intervene potentially with um, fiber supplementation, then you might be able to truncate that process and actually maintain your nutritional status. Um, fibers come in many, many different forms. And so in this study, we um, set out to test um, um, at least two different fibers. So here's the study design. So our control group, and this is a rodent study, this whole thing is a rodent study um, because it's just the easiest to control um, when you're doing, uh, when you're testing your first conceptual idea. So um, our control diet, if, if any of you out there do mouse studies, your um, quote unquote chow tends to be about 18 to 20% protein. And so that was our, our control. And that's based on um, what's called like the AIN 93G diet, which is a growth and maintenance diet for rodents. That's the amount of protein an adult mouse needs to, to thrive and live healthy. Um, and uh, so we selected a control protein replete group, and then we devised two low protein groups, um, a 10% protein group, which is considered protein restricted. And there's data to show that if you go 10% or less, you can induce all the stress responses of protein restriction in the host. So we had um, two sets of protein restricted diets, one that had 5% fiber supplementation and one that had 15% fiber supplementation. And we tested two different fibers. Uh, we tested cellulose, which is traditionally a non-fermentable fiber, and then inulin, which is a highly fermentable fiber. And uh, just for your reference, 5% is actually more physiologically relevant and 15% is sort of a super physiological level of fiber, which I doubt most people actually eat, but we chose those to, to test the two ranges of fiber consumption. Um, we put the mice on these diets for three weeks and we measured, um, uh, we took stool um, at baseline and at week three for microbial analysis. And then we also harvested tissues, liver, muscle, fat, and blood for metabolic analyses. So um, measuring uh, amino acid uh, production directly is extremely difficult and, and, and highly variable because you're constantly balancing amino acid synthesis and production with uh, ubiquitination of, and de degradation of bacteria. So getting an accurate measurement from, from blood, uh, really in the absence of stable isotope labeling is really quite difficult. Um, 
So we look for surrogate markers, at least this in this first phase of the study. In the second phase, which I can talk about later, we are doing the isotope labeling. But in the first phase, we look, we needed other markers that we could reliably measure. And so this paper was really um, led us to um, FGF21, which is actually um, an endocrine molecule that studied a lot in the diabetes and obesity field as potentially like the silver bullet for obesity. And I can, I'm not gonna go into that, and, but there's a lot of papers out there if you're interested. But there are a few papers such as this one showing that um, FGF21, which is a host nutrient sensor, um, is elevated in the face of protein restriction. And um, when FGF21 goes up, it's a sign of nutrient stress. So you want your FGF21 to be low. That's a, if your FGF21 is not elevated, it's a sign that you're sort of in nutrient balance. And so uh, we used FGF21 as our surrogate marker for, for protein restriction and whether our protein restriction was actually working. And um, this paper had shown that um, um, protein restriction, I believe between eight and 10% could induce the FGF21 response. And this is the pathway by which FGF21 um, uh, uh, induces its effect on the host. Um, and so when you have a nutrient, so if you look on the left-hand side, a nutritional stress, which would be, uh, in this case, a protein restriction, you induce EIF2 alpha, and it induces the host to adapt. And one of the ways um, that uh, FGF21 works is it actually mobilizes lipid as an energy source. So the reason why it's been sort of a silver bullet, been, is being investigated as a silver bullet for obesity is because it mobilizes fat when FGF21 is elevated. And so could you actually in, uh, exogenously administer FGF21 and actually induce fat mobilization um, and ultimately fat loss? So, and we actually, when FGF21 goes up in our mice, we actually also see that the, the, the fat pads will, will decrease. Um, but that's not what we're studying necessarily in this, in this particular study. But as I say here, fat mobilization, it also will have effects on food consump consumption and energy expenditure. So um, in uh, the first, I'll so now get into to data. That was a very long background, but I hope it was helpful. Um, so what we're working with here is if we induce, if we feed our mice a protein restricted diet, um, we should see elevated FGF21 in the plasma and circulation. And this, can all, this is often also reflected in the liver, which is the primary source of FGF21 production. So in the gene expression, you can also detect FGF21 in the liver. And um, it should also have an effect on host endogenous amino acid biosynthesis. Um, your liver can also make amino acids, um, usually not the essential amino acids because they're essential for a reason. It means your body can't make them, you need them from the diet. So, um, uh, but your liver can make non-essential amino acids. And so if you are uh, nutrient stressed, um, your, your liver production of amino acids should theoretically go up. So here's just the first bit of data comparing our control mice, which is our uh, protein replete mice. On the top, I'm showing the gene expression in the liver, and in the bottom, I'm showing the protein levels in the plasma of FGF21. And we're just confirming here that on the PR group, which is the protein restricted group, we have elevated um, FGF21 in circulation and in the liver very significantly. So indeed, we are inducing protein uh, restriction and deficiency in our mice. So this is more of confirmatory data and has been shown in the literature before. But then um, uh, in, the second, in the second panel is the data from our fiber supplementation. So in white are the mice that are on the inulin, which is the fermentable fiber, and in gray is the cellulose, which is a non-fermentable fiber. What we expected was um, to have a mitigation of the FGF21 response with inulin supp supplementation because we know microbes like fermentable fibers and they should be able to access the carbon in the inulin much more easily than in cellulose. However, what we saw was the complete opposite. So what we saw was the FGF21 response in um, uh, the inulin treated group was, was highly, was elevated, which means that the host is, sense, is still sensing a nutrient stress. Whereas the mice that were on cellulose were not sensing the nutrient stress um, and were more closely, uh, um, um, uh, more closely, um, they looked more like a, a mouse that was, was um, 
uh, had protein in their diet. Obviously not like, exactly like the control group, but was significantly less than the, than the um, inulin group. And the same pattern was reflected in the, um, in the plasma protein data. So um, that, was, that was the opposite response from what we expected. And then when you look at the liver uh, amino acid production, um, we saw a similar pattern. So in the mice that were on the um, consuming the inulin, the five or 15% supplementation, still um, were producing um, uh, amino acids, which means that it was still sensing, even with inulin supplementation, was sensing that there was a deficiency. Whereas the mice that were consuming the cellulose, the body was not sensing the deficiency in the same way. Um, and ASNS and 3PGD are, um, genes that, that synthesize amino acids in the liver. So this was very curious to us, why in the world that um, uh, cellulose seemed to be mitigating the response differently because theoretically the microbe should not be responding to, to cellulose. So then the question was, what is going on with the microbiome then that maybe might offer us some clues. So when we sequence the microbiome, this is a PCOA plot here um, that I'm showing you of, of just overall diversity of the gut microbiome. Um, that baseline uh, on the left, all the mice, um, they're on the same diet. This was before they were placed on diet. They all cluster together. Um, and then at three weeks, the, well, the first obvious observation here is that all the microbiome of all the mice shifted after three weeks. And that is likely just a baseline variability and stochastic nature of the microbiome that occurs over time. You get drift over time, and that's, that's pretty natural. Um, we didn't expect to see this much drift, but drift is very normal in the gut microbiome. So within the three-week time point then, now the mice have been split up onto their different diets for this whole three weeks, then within that we wanted to look for differences. And the thing that stood out was the mice that um, were on the cellulose diet, which are the red circles, whether it's closed or open, tended to cluster um, uh, closer together than the mice that were on the inulin-based diet. Um, but most pronounced was the mice on the 15% cellulose diet definitely clustered furthest away from all the others. Um, so there is a different microbiome that's being uh, shaped with that cellulose diet, and particularly the high cellulose diet. Likewise, the 15% inulin group also shifted. So the two 15% fiber groups were the most different from each other. So that told us the two fibers are definitely doing something to the microbiome. Um, if you look uh, at the um, diversity, uh, again, in a different way, um, an, uh, the black dots are the baseline, so they're all fairly similar diversity. But then after three weeks, you can see how the diversity changed over time. And the mice that were on the cellulose group had the least um, drop in their diversity. So somehow the cellulose seemed to maintain the, um, the diversity of the microbiome better than inulin, which again is very, very different than what we, what we hypothesized. So we then asked, okay, we have this FGF21 response and we have these changes in the gut microbiome. Um, is it that the gut microbiome, the certain bacteria in the gut are producing uh, amino acids um, in response to cellulose and therefore influencing the FGF21? So we did a correlation between FGF21 and different bacteria that we were, we were seeing at the, at the genus level. And so we saw in blue, um, uh, these are bacteria that are negatively associated with FGF21. And on the right, uh, they're in the red are bacteria that are positively associated with FGF21. Now remember, when FGF21 goes, goes up, um, that means that you are, um, you are sensing a nutrient stress. So what you actually want is a negative correlation is a sign that the bacteria, if the FGF21 is going down when certain bacteria are blooming, it's more likely then that the blooming bacteria are having an influence on host amino acid status via your FGF21 measurement. So we're really interested in these bacteria that are represented by the blue bars. Um, if we look at it now based on the fibers, um, and we just take the 15% fiber supplementation groups, which I showed you in the PCOA plot were the most divergent, um, we can see that the bacteria that are in blue on the left-hand figure that are um, uh, negatively associated with FGF21 are also the ones that are uh, written in blue in this figure. 
And so we were interested in, in that and we found that all the bacteria here that um, were in blue, the majority of them except for the top two, um, were all associated with the 15% cellulose group. So that was telling us that the cellulose is indeed creating a shift in certain, a bloom of certain bacteria that are inducing, in, whether directly or indirectly, um, a suppressed FGF21 response. So we really started, this is our way to hone in on which bacterial candidates might be the candidate de novo amino acid producers. So going back here, um, one of the bacteria that um, really jumped out at us was the, was the Parabacteroides, which is here at the middle. Um, we actually had two different species um, that bloomed. One actually bloomed on inulin and one bloomed on cellulose, and we were able to isolate isolate those. Um, we also, um, let's see if we have this one on here, lactobacillus, yes. We also pulled out and cultivated at the top a lactobacillus, which is the most dominantly bloomed on inulin. So we wanted to pull out two bacteria that were bloomed on, that we could easily isolate, that were bloomed on cellulose versus inulin, so we could study those in better detail. So um, what we did with those isolates that we cultivated uh, anaerobically was we then did some substrate utilization assays. So um, our bacteria that we isolated uh, that was um, uh, that bloomed on the inulin was the was Lactobacillus murinus, and we grew these bacteria on minimal media, and then we exposed them either to cellulose or inulin, and then did um, a 24-hour growth curve. So this is showing you. Um, sort of the, the average data um, at the end. And um, the lactobacillus murinus, we did confirm that it preferentially uh, likes to use inulin as its substrate. And so that confirmed the sequencing data. And then on the right-hand side, you see uh, um, uh, over time that the um, lactobacillus uh, murinus also, if you look at the red lines, um, which is the inulin, you can see that um, over time it increased on inulin and decreased on cellulose um, on those diets. So indeed lactobacillus was preferentially using inulin and not um, a fan of cellulose. Then the um, other organism, our other candidate organism was the Parabacteroides distosonus. And we did the same experiment and we found that it can, it can actually utilize both the cellulose and inulin, which is what our data actually showed, but it preferentially uh, utilized cellulose when given the option. And you can see from the um, uh, sequencing data as well that over the course of three weeks, it bloomed dramatically on five and 15% inulin, uh, or cellulose, sorry, but not um, so much on inulin. So um, the P. distosonus then, as we kept honing in on this, became our candidate organism um, that may be potentially um, uh, one that we could manipulate for amino acid uh, production. And uh, because it is difficult, you know, the big question is, is there more amino acids, you know, being produced? And that's difficult to, to answer at this time. Um, we really sort of dove in on what is the genetic, um, and the functional capacity of this organism. So we sent our isolates out for whole genome sequencing. And so here's the genomic profile um, uh, uh, of this organism. And just uh, bringing your attention to the largest here, the largest pie pieces um, were uh, the functions represented by these were amino acids and genes uh, representing amino acids and derivatives, carbohydrates and protein metabolism. Uh, now protein metabolism could be metabolism of proteins that are coming in. It doesn't necessarily mean de novo production, but um, a large part of this organism's genome is devoted to um, amino acids, either degradation or production, but also carbohydrates um, could also be production and degradation. Um, if you break down those categories a little further, um, specifically uh, looking at the amino acids and derivatives of so the green pie piece, if we break that down further, um, the largest pie piece there is for lysine, threonine, methionine, and cysteine. And so that um, uh, of the amino acids, um, though those are all essential amino acids. And so it has metabolic capabilities related to those essential amino acids in a very strong way. 
Um, and then within those, uh, within those um, amino acids, if we look at the actual function, they're related to biosynthesis um, primarily. And so this is suggesting that this, um, this bacteria really has a large capacity to make essential amino acids if, if given the proper, proper building blocks. So um, now going back to um, a, a potential confirmatory test as to whether uh, the microbes are really vitally involved in this process, um, and this will be my last slide. Um, we did two studies with our collaborators. The first one was an antibiotic treated study. So essentially we wanted to wipe out the microbiome and see in a, in a protein restrict, how does FGF21 respond when there are no bacteria present? So we first did an antibiotic study, which is the quick and dirty uh, version before you try a, a germ-free experiment. And so we had um, a control group, which in black, which is the protein replete group, and then our protein restricted group um, as normal. And all of these mice are on antibiotics. So AB means antibiotics. And we have our control groups. And we just selected the 15% fiber supplementation because that was the group that had the most effect um, from, our previous, um, from our previous experiments. And so what we found was in the presence of antibiotics, so if you just look at the first two bars, you would expect the PR group to be very elevated in FGF21, which is what I had showed previously. However, when antibiotic, when the microbiome is mostly wiped out, it's not 100%, but mostly wiped out, you actually see a completely blunted FGF21 response. And no matter whether they were on fiber supplementation, they still could not signal uh, to FGF21. So the antibiotic data um, showed us that if you uh, wipe out the majority of the microbiome, you can no longer sense your protein deficiency. So then we did um, a notobi or germ-free experiment in um, two different um, strains of mice. So the first one is uh, C57 mice. And here we didn't do the fiber because we had limited number of germ-free mice, but we did, um, we compared um, conventional mice again, just repeating the experiment because this was in a different facility. Um, so SPF is our normal conventional mice. Protein restriction induces plasma FGF21 as we've shown before. But then the germ-free version has absolutely blunted um, uh, FGF21 response. So the absence of microbes, uh, complete absence of microbes, you cannot signal the FGF21. And the same pattern um, was, in, was observed in Swiss Webster mice as well. So again, if you uh, protein restrict germ-free mice, you cannot signal to FGF21. So they're not sensing the um, nutrient stress in the absence of the microbiome. So the take home messages here, um, I probably don't need to read each one for you, but um, the main take home for us here, and this is still a preliminary study and we're doing much more uh, deeper analyses now, was that um, the, the paradigm so far has been that the host um, senses nutrient deficiency through FGF21, and it's the diet that the, um, uh, uh, it's the foods that you eat triggering FGF21 in one direction or the other, and the host senses that. But what we're finding from these studies is that um, FGF21 may actually be responding to the gut microbiota, because if you eliminate your microbiota, FGF21 cannot signal. So it really is that your gut microbiome is the is the first line sensor of your nutritional status. And then it signals to your hormones and, and other endocrine factors in, in the body. Um, certain nutritional stressors. So basically if you push um, the, the system hard enough, if you uh, create enough of a nutrient stress, your gut microbiome will adapt and it may turn on genes. Actually, I mean, we know microbes do this um, in extreme environments. They will turn on genes to survive. So we've always talked about uh, microbes can't utilize cellulose, but here is a state where uh, they may need to, and a bacteria that can utilize cellulose in a normal state never would, but in this case it is. Um, and that's because we push the system to a certain degree. And so this sort of sets the ground for there's many other ways than how far can you push a system to make microbes do some pr pretty remarkable things. And I think there's a lot of research that can be done in that space. Um, again, I already discussed this, but you know, most cellulose is non-fermentable. Um, however, many bacteria actually do possess the capacity to degrade cellulose. So what do you have to do to get them to do that? 
And then finally, um, we do believe that the gut, we know, I mean, gut microbes can make uh, amino acids um, uh, de novo, but uh, we, we do believe from these studies and the studies we're continuing to do that they can actually do this in a compensatory way for overall host health. So with that, just my uh, brief acknowledgments here, my lab, really, uh, this is the work of my uh, postdoc, Anthony Martin. He spearheaded all of this. Um, our collaborators at UCSD, uh, Jack Gilbert, um, and his postdoc who did the germ-free studies, and my, uh, new, my, my protein metabolism, uh, actually my master's advisor, Don Lehman at Illinois, and then Terrence Forrester at the University of West Indies, who's doing uh, in this next round of studies, our human intervention studies. Uh, with that, I think I will take questions um, and uh, I'll see if, how, how I do that. How can I hear your questions? Thanks very much, Suzanne. Um, just imagine a virtual round of applause here. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> um, so if anybody has a question, you can just unmute yourself and ask the question or type it in the chat box and I will keep an eye on that. I'll just give people a minute to unmute themselves. Okay. And if not, I will just ask, start with a question and give people some time. Um, I was just wondering, you were saying that the gut microbiome will adapt in extreme cases, right? And that's what you've seen in your mice. And right at the beginning, if you talk, you were giving some of these examples of extreme cases, right? With a picture of the babies or, or, or toddlers with very big bellies. Mm -hmm. Has there been any studies of the microbiome in those, in those children? And is there any evidence that they have adapted uh, yeah. to that to a certain extent? Yeah, great question. Um, so um, the person who's really done a lot of this work and currently doing a lot of this work is um, Jeff Gordon from WashU. He probably about I don't know now, maybe six, seven, eight years ago, really shifted his research focus to studying, um, uh, oops, studying these, uh, I'll get my zoom back up here, sorry. Hey, there we go. Um, to studying these populations and studying severe malnutrition. And so he's mostly done profiling studies um, about the different microbiomes in, in um, healthy babies and, and, and um, uh, uh, the mal malnourished uh, uh, children. So there's definitely major shifts in the microbiome. He's just now, I believe, starting to study the protein question and whether um, the uh, um, uh, amino, the, well, he's really studying it from the protein intake side and whether microbes are metabolizing the protein differently, less so from the de novo synthesis side. But knowing him, where his interest has always been in sort of nutrition um, and nutritional manipulation of the microbiome, I can't imagine he's not going into that space. But he has access to that population, particularly in, um, in Bangladesh, um, and he's really focusing on that population right now. Any other questions? <laughs> Some background noise. <laughs> So we have the first question from the class, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so it's in the chat. Is it known what mechanisms the human body uses to recognize non-beneficial bacteria versus beneficial? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, because, uh, hmm. You know, we think of non-beneficial classically as like pathogens, right? And so obviously, as you all know very well, um, your body has many mechanisms to eradicate pathogens. But in the, in the commensal gut microbiome, your native gut microbiome, you definitely have uh, organisms that um, may not be necessarily not beneficial but they could be pathogenic if you give them a certain stimulus, or maybe they are what I call scaffolding bacteria, where they're there for structure of the community um, and for cross-feeding, but they're not necessarily directly benefiting the host in a direct way. Um, and, uh, you know, do we know if our body sort of self-regulates um, what, so I don't know the answer to that exactly, but what I can say is that, 
the gut microbiota, if you leave it to its own devices, has a remarkable, it's, it's Darwinian evolution at, at its best, essentially. So bacteria will self-organize in a way that makes most sense, um, both in terms of niche and nutrient utilization and how they can benefit from each other. And so non-beneficial bacteria for the host may be beneficial for the community. And so they're still kept in the community, but maybe they are, you know, kept at low levels or, um, you know, the host also can modulate um, in general where certain bacteria go by pH and motility and things like that, but it's not specific. Um, they're sort of broad, you know, uh, broad approaches, but within the microbiota community, individual microbes can self-regulate their, their community, but we really don't know exactly how that happens.